before we return to the argument, uh, I want to make some reading and study suggestions. There is, in general, a prejudice against secondary works, works about a thinker as opposed to studying only the text of the thinker. To my mind, this prejudice is absurd. Uh, and, uh, a good secondary works can be a tremendous instigation to your own study. For the two thinkers assigned today, I've placed here on the blackboard three recommendations. Uh, to my mind, this is the, the, the best work on Emerson's philosophy, Stephen Witcher, Freedom and Fate. A and then two recommendations for the study of Nietzsche. One uh, book by the French philosopher Deleuze called Nietzsche and Philosophy. He also has a much shorter work called Just Nietzsche, which, however, has not been translated. I highly recommend it to you if you're, if you're able to read French, because it contains, in just 25 pages, an exemplary account of the essence of Nietzsche's philosophy. And the second one is completely different by uh, an English philosopher or historian of philosophy. Uh, Simon May, Nietzsche's Ethics and His War on Morality. Uh, now, I want to take this opportunity of having recommended these particular texts to make some more general observations uh, about your, your reading, some suggestions. Uh, you know that the university is uh, good at some things and bad at other things. Uh, what's, what is, it is especially good at is teaching specific skills in consolidated domains, like how to solve problems in particle physics or how to read German. That's what it's good at. What it's bad at is our ideas, thinking surprisingly, but that's what turns out to be the case. And uh, the further you go in your education, the more peripheral formal academic instruction must be. Uh, you can't expect to learn very much in courses most of the time. Now, a very simple standard for courses is that they should not be replaceable by books. By this standard, of course, the vast majority of courses should not be offered. Uh, and uh, uh, what is most important is for you to define your own agenda, a strong intellectual agenda. The most common defect in the education of educated people is an inadequate acquaintance with the history of philosophy, the history of the major ideas in our civilization. Uh, and the quickest way to begin to remedy that defect is to combine two initiatives. One initiative is to study the history of philosophy. Uh, by far, the best history of philosophy in English is uh, the history of philosophy by Frederick Copplestone, an English Jesuit, in nine volumes, all available in paperback, which you can readily obtain. <clears throat> uh, a great virtue of this history of philosophy of Copplestone's is that it's very straightforward, a count of the doctrines of the main philosophers. And unlike most histories of philosophy, very little opinionated. Uh, now, the second initiative, uh, even more important than the first, the first, in a, in a way, 
is a background to the second, is that you choose uh, a couple of thinkers, two or three thinkers, or even just one to begin with, with the intention of reading and analyzing everything that that thinker ever wrote. So you choose a particular great mind, and you form your own intention with, with his. It is not necessarily a thinker with whose ideas you sympathize. It may be a thinker whose doctrines, with whose, whose doctrines are antagonistic to your way of thinking. And then you enter into continuing dialogue with the ideas of this thinker. If you do that in conjunction with the study of the history of philosophy, uh, you have a wonderful basis on which to proceed and to develop your intellectual freedom, your freedom from the limitations and the prejudices of the university culture. It's an entirely doable task. It requires discipline and the capacity to resist the gravitational pull of the established ideas and the institutionalized course of study. But its rewards can be tremendous. So that's all I wanted to say for the moment. You want to supplement that, Michael, in some way? Uh, just to quickly say a, a full agreement that an amazing way to rethink yourself and the world around you is to do precisely this. Take a body of texts, um, almost any of which, if you choose from great philosophical thinkers throughout the world, will fundamentally challenge most of what you think. Um, in many cases, by the end of that, you may still disagree with them very fundamentally. That's fine. The goal is not to find figures you agree with. The goal is to find great figures who will challenge your assumptions. Wrestle with them. Be incredibly strongly in tension with them. The goal of this is probably at the end, not that you would agree with them, but almost assuredly you will not agree with anything you began the exercise with. And that is part of what we would hope you would begin to doing in a very small case in this semester, part of our hope is to give you a taste of this. Um, by definition, you're reading just <laughs> a little bit of a few philosophers within three months. Um, you won't be able to read them in tremendous depth. You're also taking other classes, etc. of course. Our goal in part is to help you begin that process by giving you that excitement, giving you excitement of reading great thinkers that will challenge your assumptions and Hopefully that excitement will then be something you can carry on to do precisely what Professor Unger was mentioning. Uh, I didn't mean to dismiss entirely the potential of university study. Uh, <laughs> apart, uh, apart from the master of skills. Uh, but uh, beyond the master of skills, the truth is that if in your course of formal education you can find two or three people who inspire you, then you can judge yourself extraordinarily lucky. And that's all you can reasonably expect. Uh, any comments, uh, observations? Yes? Favorite thinker, the most influential in your life. Excuse me? Who's like the most influential thinker For me? In well, I, I find it hard to answer that question. So the social theorist whom I most admire uh, although my work is in, in contradiction to his, is Karl Marx. And the philosophers who correspond most to my cast of mind are philosophers like Aristotle and Hegel, who attempt to have a, a comprehensive view of everything. Uh, with the great, and, and in a way, both of them also uh, are are marked by an interest in temporality, in time and in transformation. For Aristotle, in a sense, with the mind of a biologist, and for Hegel, uh, 
with uh, uh, a focus on the historical construction of humanity. But uh, I have also uh, been decisively influenced by philosophers whose ideas are, in a sense, the inverse of mine. And for me, the strongest example of that is Schopenhauer. It would be hard for me to find a philosopher whose ideas are more opposite to mine than Schopenhauer, but uh, I find him irresistible. Yes, please. Mm. A wonderful question, and what I would say is that's part of the exercise. In other words, part of the exercise is try to take the ideas you're wrestling with seriously. Not by definition meaning agreeing with them, you, you won't. If they're really challenging you, by definition you won't, and they will therefore create exactly the kind of incredible tension that you're talking about. But that's why you take them seriously, because by taking them seriously, they will challenge your assumptions. And one of the themes we'll see beginning today, but we'll see it coming up over and over again, the argument, and I sadly think there's a lot to this, that one of our dangers as humans is we tend to simply fall into habits of being that define how we act in the world, what we think about the world. Many of these habits come out of just conventions we happen to have been born into. And even when ex post facto we think we're making decisions, so as you said, you know, how do I make a decision and will these ideas help me, it's kind of in a weird way the opposite. Because if the views I'm mentioning are onto something, and I think they are, we don't actually make many decisions. Um, we think we do. We think we make a lot of decisions in our lives. We think we're guiding our lives through things that we think are important. Um, sadly, we kind of just do things out of habit. And again, those habits largely come out of conventions. And the reason I say this in answer to the question is part of the goal of the exercise of really taking ideas that will challenge you seriously is you will very quickly see the degree to which much of what we think about ourselves, the world around us, our, our daily lives, really are just these conventions. And by seeing that, and by really challenging that, and by therefore allowing yourself the possibility of rethinking the self, the world around you, your, the entire world that's been created, kind of sort of <laughs> through passive um, responses to the world, that then gives you the possibility of rethinking all of that. And to finally get to the heart of the question, um, then it begins the possibility of your actually being able to actively be involved in your life, involving not just decisions, but even at a larger level, sort of remaking the world around you. And, and I think that is, in a very strong sense, difficult to ever achieve unless one goes through the process of really allowing your, your fundamental ways of being to be challenged. But I understood your, your question as also being a question about how to approach this contradiction between belief and practice, right? And uh, so we live in a, in a civilization in which the dominant influence for 2,000 years has been a religion, a Christianity. And the greatest achievements of our civilization are often unthinkable uh, other than in their relation with Christianity. Uh, and yet we, uh, we see that there's only the loosest r r relation between the practice of individual life and the organization of society in this civilization and the tenets of that religion. Uh, constantly the belief is domesticated, contained. So uh, what do we have an interest in? We have an interest in accentuating, in living, in undergoing this contradiction between what we think and how we act. <laughs> 
because that then becomes the device of our arousal from our, from our slumbers, from our routines, from our sleepwalking, uh, and the great lever of transformation, of self-transformation, before the transformation of society. Uh, so I don't think one should be ashamed of it or one should repress it. One should face it uh, and, and see in it the promise of a higher form of life. Now, that problem is associated with a, uh, one of the most common, common mistakes that we all make in our existence which is that we devote our lives to aims that are too small. Uh, and if we could awaken ourselves through this contradiction between belief and experience, we would have a better chance of enlarging our ambitions. Yes, please. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the people who work uh, uh, with the university, you explain your approaches in terms of the sparkling of the philosophy and the motor stimulus. And, 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 and I find that they are uh, actually uh, esoteric and don't really uh, give you a chance to apply the details So we give them a chessboard and a chess piece. And we know that the movements of the pieces never change at its level. Even the chessboard is always the same configuration. What I see in the world of politics, philosophy, and ideas is there are no rules, or the rules are, are meant to be broken. And it's those individuals who have But I'm not sure whether the question is philosophical or political. That is, you. It's philosophical. It's, it's, it's addressing the, the issue of the texts that we read and the level of frustration that we um, incur to try to meet. Because at the beginning, because you started with philosophy and ended with politics when you were giving your examples, I just want to focus on the beginning of your remarks because it, it seemed that the motivation was the frustration at dealing with real experience, reality, raw experience in an, in an inquiry like ours, the experience of human existence. Uh, and so you want something that's concrete and that deals with the concrete. But the paradox of our situation, of the relation of the mind to experience, is that in order to be able to receive experience, you have to distance yourself from it somehow. Because down here below in this sublunary world of ours, as in the university culture, we're surrounded by these frozen preconceptions, these habits of mind, the disciplines, their methods. And they're like a screen that prevents us from having a fuller recognition of, of experience. So the hope in philosophy is uh, 
and the imperative in philosophy is that we somehow have to escape. We have to get onto a rocket and escape this gravitational field so we can see from a greater distance, but with the aim of coming back, of, of understanding what can't be seen because of that, that screen. And this is, uh, may seem often an impossibly ambitious task, but that's what justifies this, this mode of intellectual life that we call philosophy, that hope. Maybe you should begin, Michael. Oh, oh, oh although we have, I think, Getting one more. more. Yeah, yeah, last question. Yeah, please. So, so I just have a question about you know, personal ambition and you know, um, how, where, how do you distinguish um, personal ambition from like, you know, um, how do we know that our Well, you know from what I said in the first day of class uh, that I don't believe in the idea of philosophy as a super science, uh, as if we had some metaphysical access to the essence of the world that could be distinguished from what we learn in the particular domains of inquiry. I think that's a pretense. And I think that that pretense has largely served as a vehicle of wishful thinking uh, in the service of some kind of self-help, and especially self-help against the, the, the terrors of these flaws in our condition especially our mortality. Uh, so I don't believe in that. Uh, on the other hand, the disciplines as they exist are all these forced marriages between method and subject matter. And they induce us to confuse the dominant ideas with the way things are. So somehow we have to rebel against the limitations of the disciplines attempting to go beyond them into the penumbra that surrounds them. Uh, the very limit of what is thinkable and speakable without embracing the pretense of metaphysical insight into the fundamentals. Uh, and uh, in that, relentlessly to turn against the seductions of wishful thinking. We shouldn't want feel-good stories, lullabies. We should want to discover, as most we can, the truth about our situation. Uh, so it does require courage. Courage is the enabling virtue without which all other virtues are rendered sterile. Uh, so that's a... a, 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 a a summary response of how I see what we can, what we can expect from, from, from philosophy. Philosophy is not as if it were some specialty. It's not a little specialty like the idea of the thought police, and it's not a grand specialty like the idea of the super science. Philosophy is the mind at war. The mind is the mind going to the brink of what it is possible to discover uh, and not renouncing any of the instruments supplied by the established disciplines. And therefore, on this view, intimately related to an attribute that defines our humanity which is our transcendence. There's more in us than there is in any particular context of society or of thought. We spill over, we exceed, we have an element of surfeit, of excess, of transgression, uh, and 
Philosophy is the translation of that attribute uh, into a faculty of the mind. Great, indeed. So let us then, and this is a very nice segue for it, turn to our two thinkers of today. We will be discussing Emerson and Nietzsche, and the way we'll be organizing today's session is I will begin with a few introductory comments on these two philosophers, focused more on the reading. We will then open things up for questions on the, the text themselves and their arguments, and then Roberto will turn after that to working through the larger implications of this philosophical position in general. Now, the reason I say this has been a good segue is because these are two thinkers who have become, and especially even particular words and terms they have used, that have become kind of part of common culture. And they've become domesticated into ways of thinking about the self that have actually become very, very common in America. And we'll see in particular this is true with Emerson. One of the reasons we want you, wanted you to read them is because I suspect in both cases, within about two sentences, um, you were realizing you were dealing with very different thinkers <laughs> than they have been commonly read in the common culture. Thinkers who are absolutely about trying to force us to absolutely rethink everything about, about our lives, challenge our most fundamental assumptions, and even when they use terms, and again, this is going to be particularly true of Emerson, that have become part of a common currency in America, I'm sure you realize very quickly, um, he meant by these terms things very differently <laughs> than the ways we now tend to use them, even though it's literally the same terms, and sometimes you can even trace it a direct influence. So. My goal here will be to lay out very briefly some of the positions, um, why these figures are so radical. I think that will be an easy point. I'm sure, you, again, you saw that after reading two sentences of each, and, of course, what their larger implications are. Now, to make this argument, let me begin with a contrast, which will be helpful because I think it's telling of the ways these two thinkers have been domesticated in a sense. So as a contrast, let's quickly review in just a few sentences, it sadly may not take a lot much more than that, some of the themes that we saw in our readings from last week, or reading, but readings that were actually, a reading that was actually trying to encapsulate an entire approach toward moral philosophy. As we noted, that entire Anglo-American tradition of thinking about morality operated through a series of key moves that, as we discussed, were very dangerous in the degrees to which they limited the degree of questioning and challenging that you were being asked to undertake. Very briefly, the move was to say, fundamentally, by implication, our problem as humans is we need to kind of polish our rational will, right? <laughs> like our tendency is we don't think clearly enough. And so the goal is to say, Morality should be thought of in terms of rational individuals with their free will rationally deciding amongst a set of, of restricted possibilities what the proper thing to do is. And then the entire debate of the tradition operates around these three key questions. Do you define that decision-making process as one of coming up with universal maxims? Do you define it as a consensus among these rational individuals deciding what would be best? Do you have defined consequentialist um, criteria? Again, usually a utilitarian ethic that will rationally be decided. And as we noted, the key move is always to cut out all of the key questions about what we could perhaps be thinking about. You were not asked to, and in fact, I'll put it more strongly, the whole way of arguing prevents you from questioning the world you're living in, questioning the self, questioning <laughs> the will, questioning what it even means to make a so-called rational decision. It involves putting to the side any question about whether the world we are living in should be in any manner, shape, or form questioned. And the way all of this is accomplished is precisely by creating these artificial scenarios where you cut out all the questions of historically, how did we get to this moment? What are the conceptions of the self, of the conceptions of, of, of the world around us that we are living in? You create these artificial scenarios where it's simply, okay, four people on the raft, three pieces of food, which, what is the proper decision? And 
That's all you're being asked to choose. And then again, the idea is you're honing your rational abilities to make rational decisions by having these restricted set of possibilities in this abstracted situation that, of course, would never actually happen. And as we noted last week, part of why this is so chilling is that the very terms the exercise is employing are terms that have become very much common currency. They are very much reminiscent of, to give a not random example, rational choice theory, which operates by basically the same principles. So you don't ask people, in fact, again, the theory works by preventing you from asking about the world you're living in, rethinking the world you're living in in any way, but rather say, oh, no, no, the natural state of humanity is simply a market situation with rational individuals vying amongst themselves for their self-interest, period. And then you work out how then they should buy successfully for their self-interest to be successful, and you cut out any question about, yes, but should we define a market this way? Should we define the self this way? Is this a proper way to construct the world? And chillingly, the traditions we were discussing last week basically replicate those same assumptions, which means you can spend your life honing your skills, polishing your, <laughs> your rational abilities to think through these possibilities, and it's not even that you won't be questioning the world around you, you're de facto being trained not to. And if you do it well, you're sort of de facto being trained to accept a world and a worldview and an entire institutional order that has now become, certainly in America, common wisdom. And I mean wisdom not in a good sense. The reason I int introduce all of this as a quick replica, as a quick repeat of our key themes from last week is that one of the dangerous ways that Emerson has been domesticated in our culture is it, he's been read in a way that kind of works into some of these assumptions. And I want to begin by emphasizing strongly how deeply this is a misreading of what Emerson is doing. If we take Emerson seriously, and our goal will be to do so, and then with Nietzsche in a few minutes, to take them seriously, they would lead to a fundamental challenging of everything you are thinking. Now, later in the semester, we will get to attempts to, to fundamentally challenge the assumptions I just mentioned by rejecting the beginning point of the individual self, rejecting a claim of following the will, rejecting a claim of rational decision-making is even an accurate portrayal of what we are really like as human beings. Today, on the contrary, what we'll be looking at is an attempt to break down this by radicalizing notions of the self, the individual self, and radicalizing notions of the will in ways that would, if we take them seriously, completely disrupt everything we were discussing last week. My way of organizing today's very quick synopsis will be to begin with Emerson, simply for chronological reasons, then turn to Nietzsche, quickly lay out some of their key arguments, lay out the challenges they are giving us, also mention as I go some of the dangerous ways these, thinking, these ideas have been domesticated to hopefully help us work against them, and then hopefully begin the process of allowing ourselves to think through the implications of these extraordinary ideas. So, very quickly, to begin with Emerson. With Emerson, is our problem as human beings that we need to polish our rational skills such that we can make good rational decisions within a very restricted set of possibilities in an abstracted framework? Um, needless to say, no, this is not Emerson's concern. In fact, Emerson would begin immediately by saying, everything we have just mentioned in that is part of the problem. For Emerson, one of our fundamental problems as human beings is, and again, we will see this come, we've already mentioned it briefly, and we will see it coming up in different ways in many of our key thinkers this semester. One of our dangers is we are simply born into a world in which we will fall into an habitual following of customs and conventions that so completely dominate our way of being in the world, our way of thinking, our way of acting, that they become simply part of us. So much so that it leads us to not only not rethink the self or rethink the world around us, we think of this as simply so natural that we continue to simply repeat these habits, coming largely from customs and conventions we were born into for the entirety of our lives. If it so happens, and we are in such a situation, 
where among those habits and conventions are ways of thinking about the self along the lines of what we were mentioning last weekend. That doesn't mean it leads to a world where we are, to use these terms, more rational or more focused on <laughs> irrational decision making by the rational individual self. On the contrary, that terminology can become simply so much a part of our customary thinking that we're not doing actually any of that. We're just repeating customs and conventions. I say this because I will return later to how Emerson has been domesticated into a way of thinking not far off from that. So what is Emerson's response? Radical rejection of the customs and conventions we are born into. Radical nonconformity. The self consists within itself, not the self that we tend to think of. That's usually based more on customs and conventions. The radical self is something you are trying to find. There is a true self within you, a divine spark within you. Your goal is to find that true self, and through that true self, rethink everything. This requires a rejection of all customs, all conventions, all familial relationships, and all customary relationships into which you're born, and a radical focus on the self to radically rethink the world around you. For him, I keep using the word radical because this will involve actual practices like physical solitude, but much more important than the physical practices of solitude, for him what this really means is an active rejection of everything you have been taught and consistently training yourself to turn within and begin to sense your fundamental instincts about the world. Those instincts are kind of the untouched portion, right? The piece that has not yet been overtaken by these customs and conventions. And you are learning to trust that sensibility that you can find within the self. And when, it's not an if, when, that sensibility fundamentally runs against your received wisdom, received authority, what you're being told by those around you, of course it will, and you go with what you are finding within. Radical individualism, not individualism of the sense that we tend to use the term in the US, radical individualism meaning a radical, radical questioning of everything around you. The entire text of Emerson, and we've only given you one, but it's worth reading many of his essays, they're extraordinary, is teaching you to do this. As you undoubtedly noticed, I mentioned before two sentences, I'll, I'll use this time three or four sentences, um, he's a difficult writer. He is a very challenging writer. I think he is doing this because he is trying to prevent the misreading that sadly has indeed occurred. He is trying to force you to wrestle with incredibly difficult ideas and prevent you from taking easy readings of what he is saying. These are essays you have to read and reread and reread. They are very complicated. They usually do not follow a logical order at all. He's doing that intentionally because if they follow a clear logical order, you'll fall into a kind of assumed set of moves in your thinking which runs completely against what he is trying to do. And he is trying in the very ways he writes to force you to constantly rethink everything, including what you've just read two paragraphs before. The reason I keep emphasizing all of this is because let me also say a few words about the way Emerson has been domesticated. So the truth is much of the terminology I've just mentioned, and one can expand the point by going through many of his essays, are terms that have become very standard in kind of American commonplace folk wisdom. Um, we don't, in our folk wisdom, say the things we were looking at last week. As I've mentioned, um, kind of this is, it, it's, it replicates what we were discussing last week. It replicates basic economic theory that sadly guides much of the world at this stage. Um, but if you think about the ways we think about our normal lives, it's dangerously watered down domesticated Emerson. 
right? Let's go through some of the ways we will standardly think about our lives. How should I live my life? I should look within. I should look within and find my true self. And if I find my true self, I'll find me, what I personally love. My good points that I'll build upon, my negative points, but I'll learn to love and embrace those because they're just me. And then given who I am, I will decide, for example, a good career within this world that will fit me, a place where I can flourish given my strengths and where my weaknesses won't take me down too far. And thinking of a future partner to, to live my life with, I want someone who kind of works well with me. I shouldn't have to change. I'm, I'm me. And, and I should look for someone who just fits well with me and makes me feel better about myself because that's just me. And all of this is following the true self. Note immediately, Emerson would be horrified <laughs> with literally every sentence I just said, even though key pieces of that are words that Emerson will use. He would be horrified because note, the way we use this terminology it's all about not questioning anything, right? It's all about taking what I currently am, which from this way of thinking would just be a bunch of habits that I've fallen into by following social convention. I then define those as my true self. huh? I then decide I should love that thing I've become. huh? Well, why would I love a bunch of habits I've fallen into? I should then define my life by these customs and conventions that I follow, I should determine them to be me in such a degree that I'll guide my career and life choices according to them, which note by the way we put that means I won't question either myself by definition or the world around me. I will simply ask how this current thing that I currently am fits well in that world, assuming it to be a very stable and therefore perfectly fine world, not in need of radical questioning. And I'm simply placing myself within it. Good career, good life partner, all of which would not force, in fact, I'll put it much more strongly, all of which would not in any manner, shape, or form involve any questioning of myself or the world around me. So when you hear terminology like Emerson is the poet of the American spirit because he's the one who taught Americans to focus on the true self. Um, if there's some degree of truth to that, it's because we're really bad readers of his poetry, <laughs> I mean, I'm metaphorically speaking. Um, this is not what he means. That way of thinking is basically no better than what we were discussing last week. It's a slightly different terminology, but it's basically the same thing as last week. You're simply saying instead of the rational will, it's you know, my true self, but it kind of amounts to the same thing, right? Don't question the self, don't question the world, simply fit yourself well within it. In fact, if the choice is between that and the material we are discussing last week, I mean, at least the material we were discussing last week might involve some challenging of <laughs> some of your ideas. So if anything, that's a step backwards. So when we read Emerson, the key is to note the kind of way Emerson has been domesticated in the American sort of cultural understanding of the self is really a fundamental misunderstanding and rejects most of what he really cares about. Self-reliance for Emerson means rejecting the customs and conventions, which he would say define most of what we write now before we've done any, any work on ourselves, what we think about the self. It means radically questioning the world, which again is a product of these customs and conventions. The whole point is to rethink that, not situate yourself within them. And the whole exercise that he's calling us to, to, to partake in, a lifelong exercise, is one of constantly training ourselves to break free of these customs and conventions that we tend to fall into. His terminology is key here. These customs and conventions constrain us. They regulate us. They hold us back. And most chillingly, we don't even notice that they're constraining us because they become so much a part of us, we just think it's the way the world operates. His point is to make us realize, no, they are constraining us. And your goal, your life goal, is to break from them. This is why he is writing. When we think of him as the poet of America, no, 
Emerson plot down right now with the way this terminology was, is being used would be absolutely horrified. So when you read Emerson, if it sounds like stuff you, well, if you, if you skim Emerson, <laughs> I don't think if you read him carefully you could do what I'm about to say. If you skimmed Emerson and came away thinking, yes, we in America have accomplished this. We're an individualistic society. No, that is not what Emerson is saying. <laughs> For him, common Amer individualism of today is a watered down form that actually replicates the worst of what he thinks is our danger as creatures who become conventionalized and customized. As a very quick introduction to Emerson, let me now turn to Nietzsche, um, say a few words about him as well, and then touch on the implications of the two. Nietzsche might seem like an odd pairing at first with Emerson. The reason we're doing this odd pairing is because both thinkers are trying to radicalize notions of the self and the will in ways that would fundamentally break from our common assumptions. But they're also a good pairing because they take this break in very different directions that will then be helpful for us philosophically to think about. So let me now jump immediately to Nietzsche. Again, give a very, very brief introduction, and then we will turn to the larger philosophical implications. Nietzsche, too, has been domesticated in a very different way, in some ways more chilling, if that's possible, than Emerson. Um, here, too, I suspect you were surprised in many ways when you actually read Nietzsche. Nietzsche is an extraordinarily radical thinker. To say that he is trying to challenge everything you take for granted is putting it mildly. And let me just say a few quick words about what those challenges entail. What, for Nietzsche, would be everything that we spent last week discussing? Slave morality. Nothing but. Slave morality that we now so take for granted, we think being a moral person is being a slave. A slave morality that comes out of a deep hatred and resentment from all of the ideals that we should be both caring about and developing and radicalizing. And he will give this argument in the text we've asked you to read a portion of, The Genealogy of Morals, in terms of an historical rereading of the emergence of Christianity. Going very briefly, the argument is the following. Let's go back to the pre-Christian era, say, for example, the age of Homer, or the age of the great Roman aristocrats and look at what they meant when they used terms like good, which, which had its opposite bad, but not its opposite evil. What they thought about were terms of nobility, greatness, being extraordinary, which also meant the focus was on radical, radical greatness because their whole goal was not to be held back by images of the world that would in fact work de facto to prevent them from realizing the extraordinary possibilities that would exist for them. In opposition, sadly, we think of them as these egotistical beings who could think nothing other than about themselves which for Nietzsche, he uses radical metaphors, so I'll quote some as I go. This is like a bird of prey when it swoops down and grabs a lamb. Sure, the lambs afterward think, oh, that bird of prey is this evil creature that just eats us. That's from the point of view of the lambs. What if we saw the world from the point of view of the beast of prey? And this is what the genealogy of morals is about. Why do we have these ideas that lead to things like the belief that we should all be caring about each other, building a morality based upon that, with the political implications of things like democracy, socialism? Why have we fallen into these as our values with the political implications they hold? It's because 
in this world, going back to the pre-Christian era, the slaves were deeply resentful against these noble creatures. They were the lambs, resentful against the birds of prey. And so they invented a whole religion called Christianity based upon love. Love for fellow humanity. Love for fellow humanity meaning all of these great noble ideals should be rejected and we should simply learn to love each other, care for each other, and be empathetic to each other. And sadly, that morality, which is a slave morality based simply upon resentment for a flourishing of greatness, has come to take over the world and now become our commonsensical way of thinking. And what, therefore, do we need to do? Well, part of this will involve <coughs> a radical overthrow of our terminology, which you certainly see. But note, he's not simply saying, in fact, he really isn't saying, this is not his ultimate philosophical goal, let's return to being Homeric heroes or, or Roman martial aristocrats. His point is the opposite. What we are preventing by the slave morality is what really matters and should be mattering philosophically, which is the radical greatness that can come from an overcoming of the self, the self being defined now by this slave morality. And the term he will use is the Übermensch. There's not a good translation for it, which is why it's often kept in German. It's translated the Superman, which has the obvious problems, because we have a superhero now that. Um, um, the Overman, which, which is a, a literal translation, but again, doesn't really, doesn't really make a lot of sense um, in English. But the key is, the goal is to overcome this self that we currently have. Now, what would this mean in a more literal sense? Does he, again, literally want us to become Roman aristocrats? Is that really honestly what he's arguing? And the answer is no. The whole point is we don't know what this would mean because what it would mean in practice if we could learn to absolutely overthrow the customs and conventions we were born into is it would lead to a utter transvaluation of all of our values and it would mean our values, once they are being rethought, would be rethought by these extraordinary figures who would be able to make values for themselves. We can't say in advance what that will mean, but we can call for such creatures to begin to emerge, or, putting it more straightforwardly, for humans to begin breaking out of their slave morality and rethinking everything. When they do this transvaluation of values, they then would be coming up with values very much as the early Christians did, but unlike them, where it was all based upon resentment, an attempt to control the great figures around them and bring them down, the lambs bringing down the birds of prey, the Ubermensch would, on the contrary, be doing this transvaluation in such a way that they would be asking how can greatness be allowed to flourish? It would not, by definition, be a simply re simple replication of, again, ancient Rome. It also, by definition, would look nothing like a slave morality. It would be a transvaluation. And Nietzsche sees his work as training ourselves to do this. Like Emerson, there are many differences we'll get to momentarily, but like Emerson, he, Nietzsche, will therefore not give you content of what this would look like because by definition, if he gets said, oh, it's gonna look like X, Y, and Z, and we accepted that, then by definition, we haven't learned what he is teaching us to do. The goal of the exercise is to train us to break from the assumptions that we take utterly for granted, that of course it's good to be you know, non-egotistical, and of course it's good to, to be caring and empathetic and break them. Not meaning that therefore we should be egotistical and uncaring, break them in the sense that what would it mean for us to truly be great and truly flourish? He sees his work as trying to open up that possibility for us again. <laughs>
It's important, however, to note when I use the word again, and it's, this is key for when you're reading him, again, he's not saying literally become a Roman aristocrat. He is saying build a system of values based upon greatness, not based upon resentment, without giving us content as to what that would mean. Now, we mentioned the domestication of Emerson, domesticated into a kind of you know, American, um, follow your true self and don't question anything in the world. That's a very dangerous domestication of Emerson with, with dangerous implications because it means we use this terminology with, while missing everything he cared about. Um, Nietzsche, on the contrary, has or was domesticated in a very different way, but one that's also worth thinking about. Um, one of those methods that I'll spend less time talking about was a reaction about the one I'll be spending more time talking about. So one of these ways of rereading him is one associated very much with a figure called Walter Kaufman. You don't need to know his name, but I'll just mention it if you want it in your notes, who tried to argue that Nietzsche had been misread for the first half of the 20th century. And Nietzsche is really an existentialist philosopher teaching us to question the values around us. And, and, and it's simply about individuals rethinking their lives. Um, again, that's not wrong. It's just it's so de-radicalized. <laughs> um, um, that's an easy thing to say, and Nietzsche would hate anything that would just domesticate it so easily. However, what Walter Kaufman is reacting against is the reading that went on in the first half of the 20th century. And let me say a few words about that. So as you probably know, um, Nietzsche is picked up in the Third Reich, and Hitler will quote Nietzsche, many of the actual literal words from Nietzsche, as the philosopher giving a philosophy of the Nazi Third Reich. And the argument would be, we, Nazis, are going to break from this herd morality, which at that point was democracy, socialism, communism, the Ubermensch will be, he doesn't quite say this literally, but it's obvious, it doesn't take a lot of interpretation, is Hitler, right? <laughs> so Hitler will be the Ubermensch. Hitler will, therefore, create a radically new society based upon total greatness and vitality by breaking the bonds of socialism and communism and democracy wiping us out from this tiredness that's taken over um, the world where it's all just about you know, redistributive justice. We can all be kind of equally poor and we will create on the contrary this radical reflourishing of humanity. And Nietzsche is literally quoted. Um, one of the key terms that's popping up is this is the triumph of the will. And that's a term, you know, to say, you can trace the literal genealogy from Nietzsche's usage to the sort of misusage that his own sister will give it, and then it's being picked up in Nazi ideology. Now, a few things need to be said immediately. Number one, obviously, but we need to put it on the table clearly, um, Nietzsche obviously would have been horrified at this. I mean, obviously, if you go through Nietzsche's writings, Nietzsche despises nationalism. Um, Hitler is basing much of this on this extreme <laughs> claim of German nationalism. You can very quickly go through Nietzsche's writing and read his critiques of the notions of German nationalism. He despises all of that. Um, needless to say, an entire society simply following the actual words of one leader, you could not think of a more extreme form of herd mentality than that. And moreover, as far as Hitler, I, I don't think there's any way to read Nietzsche's discussions of the Ubermensch and see Hitler as in any manner, shape, or form living up to any of these. Hitler is not transvaluating any value of any kind. He's living out just a bunch of horrific <laughs> um, um, discriminatory views that he sort of lives and breathes, and it's all based upon this horrific level of resentment. So at every level, needless to say, this is not an accurate reading. However, I think it is worth philosophically a moment for us to reflect on this because part of what we will be trying to do in this class is hopefully read these texts in their often chilling originals to challenge us. But no, if they're going to challenge us, we're not taking them seriously if we don't see the chilling sides of them. Ideas that challenge us will often involve chilling implications. And these are things we need to wrestle with. And so I do want to spend a few moments talking about 
the implications of this misreading, it is a misreading, but let's talk about it. As many people have said, yes, Nazi re misreadings of Nietzsche are misreadings, but there is a reason Hitler's not misreading John Stuart Mill, right? I mean, I mean, there are things in Nietzsche he's picking up on, and the things he is picking up on are this notion of the radical, unfettered will. And I think it's worthwhile for us to ask ourselves this about its implications. So, if one wants to take this approach as a way out of what we were discussing last week, in other words, a way out of any kind of so-called philosophy that would basically train us to accept the world as it already is and not question us while thinking we're making decent decisions within it, while not really questioning anything, the move that Emerson is making, but Nietzsche in a, in a different and, and perhaps more troubling way in some ways, involves a radical focus on the will to try to utterly disrupt all of this. There are dangers with this, and I do think we have seen the implications of these dangers. Not accurate readings, but a notion of the radical unfettered will for all the incredible power it gives, for all by definition of the incredible challenges it gives, it is also worth asking about the potential dangers of such a focus. Indeed, when we mention this, just as a quick sort of <laughs> preview of things we'll be getting into in much more detail later, um, this is not the first moment that humans have seen claims of radical unfettered wills, and this has played out in various times, in various moments in history, and indeed, later in the semester, we will get to entire views that are developed in part out of rejections of the notion of a will, claiming, yes, we want to train humans to rethink the world around them, radically rethink the world around them, and yet if the thing you're using as sort of the break to disrupt everything is the radical unfettered will, the danger of that is precisely the danger of the misreadings we have seen in radically different ways in both in Emerson and in Nietzsche, which is that it is so horribly easy to take such notions developed in such powerful ways in these two thinkers and again domesticate them into being my current self. In other words, it's easy to make this into a kind of easy radical individualism where things I already think are deemed to be my radical true self that I'm using to, to radically change the world. These don't need to be thought, to rethought because that would lead to a fettering of my will and therefore I can in a sense justify my most horrible ways of thinking as being somehow this true self. So let me simply conclude by saying if you really want to take these thinkers seriously, and we hope you will, remember, one of the key things to do is you also have to take seriously that for them, if you are going to focus on the self and the radical unfettered will, you must train yourself throughout your life to, to, to teach yourself that what you currently think, what you currently assume, what you currently are as a human being is not what they are talking about. <laughs> That is what you were trying to break from. That is what you were trying to overcome. That world in which this current thing we are exists in is what you were training yourself to rethink. And I say this because it is so dangerously easy to fall into either the horrible, dangerous misreading of Nietzsche, or even dangerous and not, not nearly as horrible a way, but in the long run, a very, very dangerous way that Emerson has been misread into the sort of American ethos where, again, the, un, the, the radical individual self is simply what I think, and then this terminology becomes a way to justify not rethinking anything I already believe because that's just me, and nothing should get in the way of me, and nothing should force me to change what I think because that would be giving into custom and convention. So, if you want to take these ideas seriously, and again, our hope is that you will, keep in mind it's all about breaking the self and overcoming the self, if by the self we mean this thing I currently am. That's not what they mean, and 
really, really training yourself to break from that is an incredibly difficult lifelong journey. And that's why we've asked you to read these figures in their kind of radical glory. Um, these are radical thinkers, and when they're domesticated, they are potentially dangerous thinkers. So read them and avoid <laughs> the dangerous ways that they have been brought into our culture in varying ways over the past century. So with that as a very quick introduction, let's open up for a few quick questions, and then we will turn things over to Professor Unger. Yes, please. Um, great question. Um, we will see in a few weeks that very argument being made. So just as a quick preview of where we're going, we will see thinkers emerging, that we'll see them in, in, the, in physically what we'll be reading in this class in both the Buddhist and Confucian traditions, but one could expand that if we had, had a longer class series of sessions, that will say literally this, that, that we are so much habitual creatures that any thing that we find within us is going to be based in these kind of customs and conventions because we are so overtaken by these customs and conventions that an endless search within will never really uncover anything that hasn't already been dominated by these customs and conventions. And they will actually focus on practices based upon breaking the self in a very stronger sense that I was just using the term. Breaking the self meaning your goal is to break from your assumptions about what the self is, and you're actively trying to develop practices that will destroy the self. I mean, just to give one example that, again, has been so domesticated in the American context. So Buddhist meditation, which has now been domesticated in the American context to be all about um, you meditate to calm yourself down such that you can go back and live your life unchanged because you won't be as anxious about it, which, of course, you know, means do these practices so you don't have to rethink anything. Well, if you look at the Buddhist tradition that developed these practices, it's all about destroying the self. I mean, the whole point is the self is an illusion. Going back to the key point of your question, the self is nothing but all of these conventions. I mean, at this point, the self has become nothing but all of these habits and customs and conventions we've fallen into. And you do these practices to break the self. And that, and only after that, does it allow the possibility of truly rethinking everything. So we will see arguments along these lines. Having said that, let me return to Emerson and Nietzsche. Um, they, needless to say, will say, no, no, no. <laughs> you don't want to break the self in that, that full sense. There really is a self there that is untouched by these customs and conventions. And they would say, if you break from that, at least in their opinion, the danger is you're more likely to simply follow into customs and conventions, and that is precisely the basis by which you, you change everything. We will see. This will become one of the fundamental debates in our course, playing out across these traditions, but again, if we had more time, we would see this is one of the fundamental tensions that really cuts across most of the philosophical traditions in the world. Yes, please. Yeah, great question. Let me, questions, but let me begin with the second one. Yes, I, I agree, and this is what he doesn't want. So in other words, what I think he would not want would be for us to think the Ubermensch would simply be, as you said, the equivalent of a rational individual who, who would then together, collectively, would rationally decide what's best, because for him, Nietzsche I mean, for him, all of that world assumes everything he would want to be questioned, right? The individual, as we tend to think of it, should be questioned. The rational will should be rethought as we question it. Even the basic criteria by which the three traditions in the Anglo-American um, tradition are thinking, he would say, all of those should be rethought. 
All of which, of course, underlines your first question. So what then would it be if it's not that? In other words, if it's not an Ubermensch developing with other Ubermensch, why wouldn't they get together? The reason I think Nietzsche would be so hesitant, or that's putting it to me, would, would not want us to read him that way, is he would say, that's democracy, right? <laughs> democracy is rational individuals with having as much freedom as they, they can without restricting too much the freedom of others. And then you have a rule-based set of constraints to give us maximum freedom without constraining others, which from a Nietzschean perspective, does not actually in the long run lead to maximum freedom. What it really leads in the long run to is a radical restricting of our notion of even what the possibilities of greatness would be because we're admitting from day one some kind of absolute contract, you would call it a slave morality, that restricts what we can do. Now, again, this only underlines the key point you're asking, which is, okay, but what would this mean? And would you have just a bunch of Ubermensch leading the world? And why wouldn't that lead to lots of Hitlers, even if more you know, philosophically informed Hitlers? Um, the reason I think he doesn't want to go there in terms of what an Ubermensch would do is precisely, I think, because for him, anything he would say would restrict what we can do, anything. Now, an Ubermensch, how would an Ubermensch right now reevaluate the world? Well, one who is really doing it wouldn't simply try to create a radically new world tomorrow because that would almost assuredly be at some level simply a replication of dangers that we've already fallen into. And Ubermensch would also, of course, want us to radically, radically alter the world around us. What would this mean? I think he views it as a restriction to allow us to answer that question. <laughs> Now, that may seem like a cop-out, but I think both for him and, and a radically different way Emerson, but our reason for pairing them is, is they both want to push this notion of, of radical autonomy in this way. Both of them want to say anything we give you in terms of a content of what this would look like as we begin this work would in some ways restrict us. Now, I realize that's, that's a very unsatisfying answer, but, but putting it back to what they would want to say, they would say, but any answer you would give along the lines of how they would then reconcile their different views um, moves you into what we were discussing last week. And both, albeit radically different ways, want to avoid that. Yes, please. Um, I think uh, it's How dare. Yes. Yes. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think both in terms of what they would want, and you're right, in terms of a, a question to pose to them, that yes, what they would want would be to avoid any kind of a teleology that would say where this is going, um, because any such teleology would, by definition, prevent the key questions they want posed. So if you assume, say, a Marxist teleology that will result in a perfect communist world, needless to say, that pre-gives <laughs> where you're going, or if you want the end point to be you know, a perfect neoliberal world, that pre-gives the answers that they obviously want posed, and, and neither of those orders obviously would, would remotely resemble the kind of world they would want to build. Certainly Nietzsche would, would, would literally call both of those a slave morality. And so, Absolutely, this is why they do not want any vision of history that would be anything other than radically open. Um, but you're also right. I mean, this poses the question that I think we do need to pose to them philosophically for ourselves, that 
is the unfettered will radicalized in this way for all the heroic and exciting reasons we've mentioned, is it a dangerous sort of um, starting point? <laughs> because you're beginning with a key assumption that perhaps should itself be questioned, and you take that off the table in a sense by giving that as sort of the one thing that you can use to blow up everything else. And again, we will see traditions throughout the world that would say, well, but maybe that notion of unfettered will is precisely one of the things we should be questioning. And if you question that, it's not clear <laughs> what other position you could have if you take these if you go fully down the road these philosophers want us to go down. So yes, thank you. I think that cuts to the heart of a lot of this. Yes, please. Yeah, it's a wonderful question, and I'll begin with a, a general statement and then return to these thinkers more particularly. Um, as a general statement, sadly, we will see this over and over again. Um, all of the great figures we're reading, we use the word philosophers for them, but they really sort of <laughs> philosophers slash prophets. I mean, these are figures trying to ask us to rethink <coughs> everything. Um, they've all been misread, domesticated, pieces of their ideas taken out and built into a, a system that, as you said, directly cuts against everything they most care about. And we will sadly see this, I think I can say, for every thinker we'll be looking at. So in itself, that fact, I don't think, should be held against them, because again, sadly, it's true for all of them, which means part of our work is constantly to reread these figures and, and force ourselves to be challenged by them. Now, that being said, let me also cut to the heart of your question, which is that in the current moment, would radical claims of the unfettered self um, not allow us the kind of radical challenge we need because that terminology, even if it's been domesticated in such a horrible way, so perfectly <laughs> fits an American individualism that, that the terminology just doesn't wake us up anymore. <laughs> it just said, like that's, like if you can imagine a, a world reading these texts for the first time, that kind of radical excitement, can this terminology even work that way? Because these terms have just become so embedded in our, our way of thinking about, again, in this very domesticated way, that do they excite us? Or do you just read an Emerson think, yeah, yeah, self-reliance, yeah, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're already there, destroying everything they actually care about. Um, my hope is no. <laughs> um, my hope is that when we read these, we can train ourselves to regain that incredible excitement that clearly exists. I mean, when you, when you read contemporaries discussing these, I mean, there's just the sense of like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, oh my gosh, an exciting way, and a lot of people think, oh my gosh, this has to be stopped. But I mean, it clearly was seen as radical. And if now these ideas in this horrible domesticated way are no longer sort of breaking us from our assumptions, maybe we need to retrain ourselves and train ourselves to read them in ways that can force us to, even if that means um, <laughs> um, training ourselves to, to take a very word that we use all the time in daily practice and see it as meaning something almost fundamentally different when it's being used by a figure like Emerson. I agree, in some ways it's a more difficult challenge for us than in other texts we'll be reading in just a few weeks that, that you, you could not not be challenged when you read them, because they'll, they'll say, destroy the self. And, you know, <laughs> in an American context, that just seems, to, well, it certainly seems radical, also seems absurd. Um, in a certain way, though, we'll see those will be challenging to us in a different, but in some ways kind of a similar way, in the sense that even there, as we've seen with the meditation example, the ideas have been domesticated in kind of a, that same individualistic ethos of, of America. So sadly, I think we're gonna face this problem literally with every text we read, which will make the challenge for us all the more significant. <laughs>
Now, tons of hands, but a quick logistical question. Should we turn to your philosophical reflections? Um, it, by the way, let me also add, uh, don't worry, uh, there are literally tons of hands, well, literally meaning like, like about 13. Um, don't worry, all of these themes we will have, be continuing. We have, so we have a we... series of classes exactly. about this project. Indeed, so, so we're should we turn? to this yeah. discussion next week. Should, yes, so should we turn to you, those of you who haven't had time to, ch to speak yet, don't worry, I mean, we have many, many more weeks developing these themes. So. Should we turn things over to you? Great. So let me go by steps uh, with radical simplifications in each step. <clears throat> the first step is to go back to last week uh, and to the criticism of what is common to those approaches that I call the school philosophy, metaethics. And you remember I cited three criticisms. Uh, the first criticism is the thin down conception of morals as a book of accounts, a framework of obligations, what we owe to the others, not answering the question of the conduct of life. The second criticism is that for precisely that reason, there is no insight in this school philosophy into the conditions of human freedom, how we become ourselves, how we rise to a higher form of life. It depends on our relation to the others, and it depends on our relation to the context. And the school philosophy has nothing to say about that other than to read to us a bill of our duties to the others. The third criticism of the common approach in, in the school philosophy has to do with a paradox. The paradox is this. In a sense, what happens in the school philosophy is that ethics is reduced to politics. It seems to emphasize radically individual morality and what we owe to others as individuals. But what it produces is a conception of our impersonal obligations from a standpoint outside the self, from the standpoint of an arbitration, as if from the, from the viewpoint of the stars. And this political suppression of the perspective of the agent then has as its practical outcome an idea that seems, in the end, untenable, which is the idea of a neutral order, an impersonal order, an impersonal order of right that does not represent any sectarian view of the good. And I argued last week, there is no order that's neutral. Every order tilts the scales. And the idea of neutrality stands in place of what is a legitimate goal, which is the goal of creating an order that is open to a wide range of experience and contradiction, and that is corrigible in the light of experience. Now let me add a fourth criticism. The fourth criticism is that this school philosophy renounces the perspective of the agent in favor of this perspective of impersonal judgment. But it doesn't provide us with a bridge between these two perspectives. Let me contrast it to a characteristic of the other large project that is our main subject here in this course, the project that I called the project of responsibility and solidarity, as exemplified by Confucianism. It does provide a bridge. The bridge is this idea of joint intentionality, of interpersonal interaction. It's not just the replacement of the agent by some higher neutral will. It's the idea that the true agent in social life lies in this dynamic of relations among people and that 
real intentionality, real experience is shared. There's no such bridge here in the school philosophy. Now, that then brings me to the second step of my remarks. Uh, here we deal with thinkers who can be seen as philosophers, as ideologists of what I called in the first day of this course the project of nonconformity and self-invention. And they do take decisively the perspective of the individual agent. Now I want to make some very brief remarks about these two thinkers that I hope we can uh, pursue further next week. Looking at them together, Emerson and Nietzsche, what is the fundamental good that both of them are concerned with? The fundamental good is life. All that each of us has in the end is life. Life right now. Life in time. Life in the present moment. Uh, and this, and if anything is divine in the world, what is divine is this experience of the participation in life. But this good, which is the supreme good, is the good that we're always squandering. We're losing it. And we are, as it were, dying beforehand by many small deaths. What is the enemy of life? The enemy of life for Emerson is society and its conventions. Our conformity to this structure that comes from outside. And so Emerson says, imitation is suicide. And imitation is conformity to, to society, to the outside. And what is the enemy of life for Nietzsche? The enemy of life has a name in Nietzsche's philosophy. It is nihilism. But for Nietzsche, nihilism is not a doctrine. Nihilism is an event, a history. Nihilism is the creation of the fabrication of an impersonal good, the good or God, that then stands in contradiction to life. Life is plural. Life is becoming. Life is, in time, uncontrollable. And now we want to judge it and control it and suppress it in the name of some unitary good or reality beyond it. And that is the beginning of nihilism. And then everything that we actually experience or are and can become will be judged inferior by the light of this projection. And then there is an itinerary, which is the history of nihilism. And this itinerary has certain characteristic steps. So the first step says, it's your fault, this external reality that makes me feel and be little. That's ressentiment, resentment. Then comes the second step. It's my fault, bad conscience. I'm little and I deserve to be little. Then comes the third step, asceticism, the ascetic ideal. I will transform my weakness into a kind of strength by trying to sublimate it in some way into a higher form of life that will make me worthy in the eyes of this higher good, the God, the impersonal, whatever it is. Then comes the fourth step. We lose faith in this God or in this good, the death of God. And then comes the fifth step, the last man, or as Nietzsche calls it later, the man who wants to die who no longer believes in, ever, in, in anything. That's the itinerary of nihilism. And nihilism 
is both the threat to life, the supreme good, and the preparation for the reaffirmation of life, the enhancement of life. So the essential project is become who you are. Create a form of enhancement of life. Your life will be a work of art. Uh, now, uh, I want to deal with this way of thinking in, exemplified by these two thinkers going backward. I want to begin with the criticism of this project. Uh, defended in, a, in particular radical forms by Emerson and Nietzsche. The project that we're calling here the project of nonconformity and self-invention. Here are five criticisms. So the first criticism is it misrepresents one of the conditions of freedom, of self-possession, of coming into the possession of life. We can't do it without the others. There is a paradox. There is a contradiction in our relation to the others. We develop ourselves only through connection, but every connection threatens us with loss of distinction and of freedom, threatens us with subjugation. So how is it that we can create connections that no longer subjugate us or somehow diminish the price that we pay for connection and only then to the extent that we reconcile our need for the others with our justified fear of them, can we be free? We're not free and we don't come into the possession of life so long as these two conditions of our self-assertion continue to contradict each other. Now, you can develop this uh, uh, a little bit by comparing this Emersonian and Nietzschean ideal with the heroic ethic in many civilizations of the past. The hero is proud. He imagines himself as standing above the herd. But where does the task of the hero come from? It comes from them. He violates the collective norms in order to serve the society, the culture, as the military hero does. Or in the romantic period, even as the bohemian artist living at the margins of society does. And he, therefore, as well, craves their approval, fame, distinction, even though he claims to be above them. So there is a denial of the reality of our vulnerability, of our dependence on the others. Now comes the second objection to this view. The second objection is that as it misrepresents the ambivalence of our relations to the other, it also misrepresents our relation to the particular social and cultural world that we inhabit. We can't be free if we're estranged from this world. If we're isolated, if we can't act within a real world, we're not free. But if in order to engage in the world, we have to surrender to it, and give it the last word rather than reserving the last word for ourselves, then we're also not free. So the question is, how can we engage in it without surrendering to it? And what are the political and moral conditions under which we can be both insiders and outsiders? We can engage without surrendering. 
So there are these two conditions of self-affirmation, of coming into the possession of life. And they have some complicated relation to, to each other. And this philosophy, in its initial form, misrepresents both of them. Now comes the third objection. The third objection is that to be free and to come into the possession of life, it's not enough to transform an individual existence. It's necessary to transform society. And this, this project must therefore have a politics. But where is the politics of this project? The politics of the school philosophy was just in the unacceptable idea of the neutral order. And what is the politics of, of this project? Uh, by default, as in some of the readings of Nietzsche, it's the strong self standing above the weak herd. Uh, and, and that then, under the appearance of giving freedom to the happy few, in fact, entangles all in a dynamic of domination and subjugation. So it seems that the politics of this project would be some idea of deep freedom, a bigness that could be shared. We all become big together somehow, so that the bigness of some doesn't threaten the bigness of others. And that is like an interpretation of the ideal of the liberals and socialists in the 19th century, which was not egalitarianism, but shared bigness. The struggle against inequality was subsidiary and requiring some transformation of the structures of society about which this project, in its Emersonian and Nietzschean form, has almost nothing to say. Now comes the fourth objection. The fourth objection is that this version of the agenda of nonconformity and self-construction uh, seems to exemplify what you could call Prometheanism. It, it moves in the direction of a kind of self-deification of, of the individual. And this self-deification is based on a lie, on a series of falsehoods about who we really are and what life is really like. Uh, we're going to die. We don't understand the framework of existence. Our desires are insatiable. We depend on the others. We need to engage in a particular world. So it's a kind of triumphalism or it threatens to be a kind of beating of the drums in the presence of death. And uh, to that extent, it threatens to become yet one more feel-good story, one more lullaby, one more effort to cast a spell on ourselves, and in, in this way to incite the heroic will in the presence of mortality and groundlessness and insatiability. And we would need to cure it of this defect. And then the fifth objection is its emptiness. So we build up the self in this way through nonconformity and self-invention. And then what? What is the object? Now, uh, this objection is connected to the following uh, difficulty in these ideas. It seems that what gives weight to our autonomy is, on the one hand, our engagements, our tasks, the importance of devoting your lives to to larger rather than smaller goals. 
and on the other hand, our attachments, our loves, our devotions, our loyalties. The engagements and the connections are always in particular domains. We fill our lives with them, and then we become greater as a consequence. In other words, the ulterior consequence is the greatness, but the proximate goal are the, are the connections and the devotions, the tasks, the engagements, and, and, and the links with the others. And that, too, is misrepresented in this set of ideas. So those, are the, those would be the, the objections to this point of view as it's represented with genius in, in Emerson and in Nietzsche. Uh, now then, what's the consequence? And this then is the next step of my remarks. The consequence is not necessarily the repudiation of this project. The consequence is its correction or its transformation. So we can imagine, and we will have occasion to discuss in the next weeks, the, the transformation, the revision of this project to deal with these objections with these five objections that I mentioned, and others that are like them. And the question is, what will be left over once we deal with these objections? Now I want to race ahead to much later in the course, and now the last step of my remarks. Uh, suppose that we, that we have found ways to revise this project so that it meets all of these objections. <clears throat> Will it have lost its distinction? Will it become indistinguishable from the other major project that we'll be considering here, the project of responsibility and solidarity? Uh, it seems that it will not. That certain assumptions and claims and aspirations will remain even after all of these revisions that are likely still to distinguish it from this other project. So one of these will be the radical perspective of the agent, not joint intentionality. The agent, the individual. All we, we, what we, we, we awaken and we experience selfhood, the self contained in a mortal body with limited access to the consciousness of others. The second distinction that it's likely to have, even after the revisions, is this idea of the infinity of the self. The self has unlimited depth. There is more in the self than there is in the conceptual and social worlds that we build and inhabit. We spill over, we exceed. A third element of distinction is its relation to a revolutionary project in history. So for two or three hundred years, the world has been on fire. It's been on fire as the result of a program which has a political side and a personalist side. The political side is carried by the doctrines of liberalism, socialism, and democracy. The personalist side is represented in the most familiar form by the worldwide popular romantic culture. But the message is the message 
of the radical emancipation of the individual. We're not as small as we seem to be. We are divine through this possession of life within us. This is the project. This project is not the only project in the world. It's contested. It has enemies, but it commands the agenda. And all the other projects respond to it. This project, which is, in a sense, the strongest project, is now also weak because its adepts no longer know what its next step should be. And here we discuss its moral next steps more than its political next steps. And this doctrine of nonconformity and self-invention is intimately related to this project. It is the personalist side of this project as distinguished from the political side. And now comes a fourth element of distinction that is likely to remain at the end. The fourth element of distinction is the moral privilege conferred on rebellion, on disruption, as I said on the first day of class. There is a spiritual aristocracy in the human race. The spiritual aristocracy are the disruptors, the rebels, the prophets. Uh, this is far from being agreed in the world, but this is the import of this doctrine, even, it seems, in its revised form. Now, that's what I wanted to say by way of these, 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 these remarks, and I did not go through another set of remarks and debates for next week, which is the philosophical presupp the, the philosophical presuppositions and the political background to this project. So it depends on a certain view of the world. But is such a certain view of the world justified on the facts about the world? What is this philosophy? So you, you, you notice that Emerson and Nietzsche don't say anything or say very little about that. What would the world as a whole have to be like? The organization of nature, the physical constitution of humanity, for these views to have a basis. What are we saying? That we're a miraculous exception to the way the world is? Or are we saying that the world is constituted in such a form that there is a basis for this project in the reality of the world? And what is the politics, the political background to this, to this project? What historical transformation of humanity is this a part of? Unless we can answer those questions, it seems that we can't create a future for this project. So uh, that's what I propose as, as the part of the agenda for next week's class. We didn't have a chance to discuss this, Michael, because uh, of the sequence here in today's class. So uh, let's turn to the discussion of this next week. Indeed, indeed. And as a quick sort of jump in terms of what we'll be doing next week, so Nietzsche, as we have seen, reads Christian love as simply a slave morality, an attempt by the slaves to create a morality that will enslave us and hold us back. Next week, as we rethink this entire tradition, we will look at alternate ways of thinking about love, alternate ways of thinking about what is going on in Christian love, and looking in particular at how Hegel and the Romantic movement will come out of a very different way of thinking about love. And as always, we will do so not only because, although it certainly is historically interesting, but we will do it out of this project, 
jumping chronology, how can we use some of this to rethink some of the limitations, let's call them, of what we have seen so far today in Numbers and Nietzsche? Thank you so much, and see you next week. So, Michael, how do you suggest? How do you suggest we discuss this? Now?